morning, good morning, good morning, Sixty Church of Christ and all those who are joining us online. Today we're doing something a little different. I was going to preach on another text, but um, there's a Zoom call that takes place every week in which Church of Christ preachers are uh, gathered together. We encourage one another, and we came up with the idea that every first uh, Sunday of the month, we are all going to unify our voice and speak on one uh, specific theme, one thematic, thematic, thematic thrust. And this month, what we're going to speak about is hope. And so um, meet me in, in Lamentations chapter three and hear the words of the lamenter starting in verse number 19. Lamentations chapter three. Verse number 19. There the word of God says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it, and it is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Verse 24 reads, and the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Beloved, the title of this message is Keep Hope Alive. Keep Hope Alive. Each week I try to develop a sermonic introduction that either highlights a problem or a process or a discipline or a doctrine or some type of theme or some type of theology. Uh, but every now and then as a preacher, you come across a text in which you don't need to get clever um, because the text seems to just preach itself. And so, uh, beloved, sometimes the text can be so powerful that it sets its own stage. It, it sets its own temperature and uh, it paints his own picture. So I don't even want to pretend to be creative this morning with an introduction. I really want you to hear the words of this voice pleading in Lamentations chapter three. And I'm beginning at verse number one, but I want you to pay attention to the voice that is speaking to you this morning. There it, the, the lamenter writes, I am the man who has been afflicted under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me, he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged me and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. And though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. And he has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turns aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and he set me as a target for his arrow. He drives into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become a laughingstock of all people, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness and has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and has made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace and I have forgotten what happiness is and so I say my endurance has perished and so has my hope in the Lord and then that's where we pick up at verse 19 where he says remember my affliction and my wanderings remember the wormwood and the gall my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness. For the Lord is my portion, says my soul. And therefore, I will hope in him. Beloved, I'm not naive. I know that not everybody can relate to the cries of this lamenter. lamenter and, and, and that's okay. But I, I pray that for those who it doesn't hit you this week, I pray that you save this message. And I pray that once you have a few more birthdays or have a, a few kids of your own, um, the, the lamenter's voice will speak more relevant in your life because the lamenter is speaking to those who know what it's like to be swallowed up in darkness. That, that the message this morning or for those who know what it's like to be feel like you're drowning and there's no water. For those who know or knows what it feels like to feel like you're smothering, uh, smothering. You're the only person in the room. The, the, the lamenter is speaking to those this morning, my brothers and sisters, who knows what it's like to be tormented by life circumstances. And to his simple message for survival one on one when you find yourself in a season like this is to simply keep hope alive at all costs you got to remember to just keep hope alive if you do nothing else then remember that you got to keep hope alive and no hope doesn't fix everything and no hope doesn't make it all easy and no hope doesn't make everything okay but the reason why you got to keep hope alive is because hope is like that air that you breathe when you feel like you're drowning hope is the thing is the breath that you take when you feel like you're being smothered hope is that power that you need to get up when you've been knocked down hope is, is your endurance your tenacity your strength that you need to face tomorrow i don't know who's watching this morning but what i want to like press upon your spirit is that it is your decision to keep hope alive. Beloved, many of us are not familiar with the book of Lamentations, but Lamentations has been appropriately named because essentially what it does is it presents to us five separate dirges or songs of lament. But what I really want you to focus on is that the literal or the Hebrew name for the book of Lamentations is this word called Echa. Echa is not really a name, but it's actually an interrogative that's asking a question either why or how. So essentially they named it off of um, the idea of how did this this happened or how did it come to this? And, 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 and when you uh, look at the book of, of Lamentations, what you'll find out is that the context speaks to one of the most catastrophic events in Jewish history, and that is the siege of Jerusalem. If you remember, or if you're a student uh, of, of Jewish history, you remember in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar brings his Babylonian empire and the might of all of his military forces, and they utterly destroy Jerusalem. The city is burned to the ground. The homes are being pillaged. Thousands of people are put to the swords. Thousands of people are placed in chains and led in exile. If you remember, uh, Daniel and, uh, uh, and the three Hebrew boys are all led off in exile to Babylon. Uh, but then put uh, the nail in the coffin, the center of Jewish life, Mount Zion, the temple in which God was housed, was demolished stone by stone and brick by brick. And now this once powerful nation of Israel, this once beautiful city of Jerusalem has now uh, been utterly and completely destroyed. And the reason why nobody reads Lamentation is because for five straight chapters, the only thing that you get is this dark and defeated voice letting you know again and again that there are folk who are starving to death. There are folk who have no food. There's no water. Our children are being killed or they're being enslaved. Uh, we are destroyed. We are eradicated. We are being exterminated. We are being annihilated. We don't have peace. We forgot what happiness is and we have no more strength. And beloved, if you're a student of the Bible, you know that Lamentations follows after the book of the prophecy, Jeremiah, uh, when Jeremiah is just a collection of of prophetic books that have a singular message. And this is the simple message of Jeremiah. God told me to tell you that if you do not get your act together, then it's not going to end well. God told me to tell you that if you don't stop doing what you're doing, then it's going to end bad. And so Jeremiah models what every preacher knows that no matter how much you scream and sweat and preach and shout, people are going to be people and sometimes that requires God stepping in in order to get somebody's attention. And so beloved, I want to make it clear that last week we saw that not all suffering that you go through in life is deserved. That sometimes life can put you in a situation in which your suffering is unwarranted. 
But for those watching this morning, what I want you to see is that there's many of us who know that we spent years making a bed and now the day has come where you got to lay in it. There's some of us who are watching this morning that know that we spent years playing with fire and then the day came in which we got burned. Some of us who are honest this morning understand that many of us have been living off the deep end. We've been uh, leaving ourselves wide open. We've been living reckless. We've been playing on the edge. And my brothers and sisters, one of the most difficult places to find yourself in life is when the day comes that you actually fall into that hole that you have been digging for yourself year after year after year. And if you're not careful, the lamenter wants you to know this, that if you're not careful, that the day will come in which you put yourself in a situation where it will be too late. It'll be too late to call your mama. It'll be too late to call your daddy. It'll be too late to throw money at it. It'll be too late to take it back. It'll be too late to start over. And so for five chapters, what we find in Lamentations is that there is a message for those who are damaged and those who are diseased and those who are decimated. And it is simply here in chapter three, keep hope alive. There's a message for those that are depressed and for those that are desperate and for those that are despondent. And it is keep hope. Hope alive. There's a message for those who are demoralized and for those who are downhearted. And it is simply keep hope alive. And so when you look at the text, he says, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. And then he says, but this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope, which lets us know that the author here, the writer here, he called something to mind in the midst of all of this darkness that caused his hope to be resurrected. So what did he what did he call to mind? Well, the first thing that he highlights is the steadfast love of the Lord. When you look at the text, he says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Or some translations actually say because of the steadfast love of the Lord, we are not cut off. Or we are not destroyed. And so in order for you to get the meat behind this, we got to go to seminary for just a second. We call Sigsby. We're the educated church. We like to shout, but we want to have an educated shout. And so when you look at that word, it is rendered with two words in English. But in the Hebrew, it's one single word. And it is not agape for love. It is this Hebrew word called chesed. Chesed is this Hebraic word that gives translators all kind of fits. And the reason why it gives them fits is because Chesed is so much more than just a word. It is the idea that is so deep and so powerful that one English word cannot fully encompass what chesed means. And so depending on your translation, Semitic linguists have translated it steadfast love or loving kindness or kindness or mercy or loyalty because chesed and the principle of it. It encompasses all of those. It encompasses steadfastness and faithfulness and love and loyalty and kindness and grace and mercy. But what I really want you to see is that the, the idea of chesed is a relationship dynamic. And it is a relationship dynamic that is based on three main qualifiers. The first thing is that chesed is a relationship dynamic in which one person is in desperate need of another person. The second thing that chesed is, is that it is also uh, the help that this person provides to this person is essential to the well-being of this person. And then finally, chesed is when the person on this side who decides to help, decides to help freely and not out of forced obligation and not out of legal sanctions, but they help this person out based on simply how they feel about the person and you see this chesed dynamic play out with Ruth and Naomi because again and again and again Ruth will not leave Naomi's side and when you read through the book of Ruth you come across chapter 3 and verse 10 in which Naomi is speaking to Ruth and she says this last kindness or this last chesed is greater than the first because you have not gone after the young men, neither rich nor poor. So what is Naomi saying to Ruth? She is saying, Ruth, you have every reason to leave me. You are free from all obligations. You don't have any legal sanctions that's keeping you here with me. You could have gone on to someone or something that is better or who could give you more. But because of your chesed, you continue to stay right by my side. And my brothers and sisters, that is the word to resurrect your hope that the relationship that 
you have with God can only be described in one way, and that is chesed, which means that God will always choose you. And my brothers and sisters, if that doesn't put some hope in your heart, and if that doesn't put a hallelujah on your lips, then I suggest you go pause this video, you go walk to your bathroom, and you look in the mirror, and let me suggest, and let me help you out with what you're going to see when you look in the mirror, you're going to see a thief, you're going to see a liar, you're going to see a crook, you're going to see a fornicator, you're going to see a glutton, you're going to see a drunk, you're going to see a thief, and if you keep looking, you'll see a cheater, you'll see an adulterer, you'll see selfishness, you'll see ratchetness, You'll see wretchedness. And if you're honest this morning, you'll look in the morning in the mirror and you'll see every reason why God should have terminated his relationship with you a long time ago. God should have thrown you away a long time ago. God should have wiped his hands clean of you a long time ago. But I thank God that God don't have friends like you and me because we all know that if this was anybody else but God, we would be screaming, I don't know why you still deal with them. I don't know why. You still choose, uh, ch uh, choose them. I don't know why uh, you still are helping them out. They ain't no good. They don't do nothing but cheat on you. They don't do nothing but take from you. They don't add nothing to your life. They don't do nothing but use you. They don't even talk to you. You deserve so much better. And I don't know if you got it, my brothers and sisters, but do you know how much we cheat on God? Do you know how much we give everybody else attention but God? Do you know how much we listen to everybody else but God? Do you know how much we violate? God and embarrass God and ruin God's name and when God has every reason to throw us away God says I still choose you you ain't no good but I still choose you you can't get it together but I still choose you I'm going to choose you today I'm going to choose you tomorrow I'm going to choose you the next day and no matter how much you mess up I'm still going to choose you because of my chesed. So I don't, I don't know about you, but that's, that's, that's good to me. I can stop preaching right there. Um, so he says, he says that I recall the steadfast love of God. And that is what brought hope back to my heart. The second thing is the compassion of God. So you see in the text, he says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Uh, the Lord's loving kindness never ceases. And then he says, his compassions or his mercies never fail. And I think this is so important. I love that this is there because after the sermon, I, I, I challenge you to go back and read the first 19 verses. And when you read the first 19 verses, I want you to highlight every time you see the author use uh, that pronoun he. And, and, and look at the language. He says things like he has afflicted me with tribulation. He has broken my bones. He has hunted me. He has walled me up. He has made my chains heavy. And he has shut out my prayer. And, and the idea, though, the language is so harsh that the author gives you the idea that God somehow wants to see him in pain. That God somehow hunting him. That God somehow hates him. And if you're not careful, you will look at your life circumstances when you have to lay in the bed that you made and you will convince yourself that God wants you to be in pain and that God hates you. And so my brothers and sisters, what you got to understand is that I love that he puts it here that his compassions never cease or his mercies never fail. And he says they're new day by day, because when we talk about compassion, what we are saying is that. This is a person who is intimately in, 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 is intimately involved and invested in what a person is going through. They are involved and invested in the plight of a person, the struggle of a person, and the survival of a person. The Hebrew word here is rahamin. Rahamin is, it literally translates wound. And I want to explain that. It, it gives the idea of a mother's feeling toward her child. That is in her womb. And so what the, the whole concept is the unbreakable bond that a mother will feel for her unborn child. And so when you look at it and you really analyze that a mother does everything possible to make sure the child develops 
the child grows, the child gets stronger. A mother is so invested in the well-being of the child that she won't eat certain foods because it'll harm the baby. She won't drink alcohol because she'll harm the baby. She won't take certain medications because she'll because it'll harm the baby. She can be sick and not take antibiotics because it'll harm the baby. And so uh, what he is trying to highlight here to you is that uh, uh, is that the way in which a mother feels for her unborn child, that is how God looks at you. And so my wife now is pregnant. She's in her third trimester. And I watch her often uh, to see how she interacts with our child. And, and what I notice is that uh, my wife does some weird things. She does things like uh, she talks to her belly. And, and sometimes it throws me off because I, I don't know if she's talking to me. And I walk into the room and I'm trying to figure out she's on the phone. And I realize she's talking to her belly. Sometimes uh, she sings to the baby. Or sometimes she'll put... Uh, music to her stomach so that the baby will hear. And, and, and most often times she could be watching TV or a movie and she's constantly just rubbing, just rubbing her belly. And so I, I'm watching her and I, you know, I, I just laugh at her sometimes. But one, one day I walked in the room and, and she was reading, you know, she was reading a book to the baby. And so when I watch all these things, I tend to ask myself questions like, I don't really understand the whole point of that because the baby exists in another world. The baby exists in darkness. And I don't understand the point of doing all this because the baby doesn't really understand what is going on or what is happening. The baby doesn't understand the words or sounds that happen outside of the womb. The baby hasn't even seen Courtney's face. And so uh, one day when I walked in the room and I saw her reading, I just had to ask her, I'm like, Courtney, you do realize that, you know, there's, there's plenty of time for that, but the baby does not even understand what you're saying. It doesn't understand all these things that you're doing. And so she looked at me and she said, um, it, it doesn't matter if she understands. It's not about her understanding. It is simply about her knowing that her mama is right there. And my brothers and sisters, that's a word for those in the darkness. And that's a word for those who found themselves in a hole. And that's a word for those who have been burned. That the lamenter wants you to know that even though it doesn't seem like it, and even though it doesn't feel like it, and even though it may not look like it, God is right there. And, and I want to pause and focus on somebody who may be watching this morning and they may be in a relationship that they have no business being in and life is hard and life is frustrating. But what I need you to know is God is right there. There, I need a young lady or a young man who is expecting an unplanned child on the way and life now is scary for them and life is uncertain for them. I want them to know that God is right there. This is for somebody who's watching and maybe you got some legal problems. Maybe you have a court date coming up and, and life now is at a standstill as you await your fate. But you need to know that God is right there. There. there may be somebody who's going through divorce proceedings and now life is ugly and now life is mean. But you need to know that God is right there, beloved. I need the addict to know. I need the hustler to know. I need the young person and the old person. Anybody who has messed up in life, I need you to know that just as a mother is always there for her unborn child. God still has his hands on you and God still is talking to you and God is still protecting you and God is still emotionally invested in your development and in your maturity and in your survival and that God will always love you no matter what you have done and God will always care for you even when nobody else will and God will always hold you when everybody else has pushed you away and God will always comfort you even in the midnight hour because his compassion Never ceases. So uh, the author here, he says, therefore, I have hope because I recall the steadfast love of God. I recall the hope of God. I mean, uh, the compassion of God. And then finally, I recall the hope of God. The lamenter, he keeps hope alive because when he looks at this, he, 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 he says, finally, um, that the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope, and watch the language, I hope in God. Beloved, hope is most simply defined as the expectations of something happening. And what makes hope weak or what makes hope powerful or what makes hope dead or what makes hope alive is 
based on the person that we place our hope in. For instance, if, if I say, I, I hope my surgery goes well, the vitality of my hope, the lifeline of my hope, and my ability to get a good night rest tonight is dependent upon the track record of the surgeon. If the surgeon has a 50% survival rate, uh, then my hope is going to die and I'm going to be up all night. Or, or if my wife calls me and she says, um, uh, babe, the car won't start. And so I hope uh, that you can fix it. Well, uh, I can tell you right now that my wife's hope is as good as dead because she should have called AAA instead of calling me. Because I do not have the ability to meet her expectations. And so my brothers and sisters, hope survival is based on the person that we place our hope in. So the lamenter says, I place my hope in him. And, and, and when you hope in God, it, it's no longer an expectation if something happens, but it becomes an expectation for when something happens. That, that when you hope in God, it, it's no longer a, a wishing for something to happen, but it is a knowing that something is going to happen. And so what I want to highlight to you is that when you get to verse 24, uh, he says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in the Lord. Or when you look at Psalms 42 in verse around verse uh, five, it says, why are you downcast, O my soul, hope in God? Or if you look at Job, or if you look at uh, any of the other hope passages in the wisdom literature, what you find is that authors repeatedly speak out loud. And, and, and the question is, who are they talking to? Because the context is that they are rarely talking to God. So who are they talking to? And so I, um, I don't even, I don't have a deep theological uh, explanation. There's nothing in the Hebrew. There's no syntax that you can run to that can make you say, man, that, that was well studied. It is simply this. They are speaking to themselves. Because if you're going to keep hope in God alive, you are going to have to constantly reaffirm your hope in God because when you find yourself in seasons of life where you're incarcerated or you're depressed or you're anxious or you're strung out the only thing that is going to keep you putting one foot in front of the other is your hope and, 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 and the only thing that's going to keep you from throwing your hands up in defeat is hope the only thing that is going to keep your nose above water is a daily dose of hope. And so my brothers, I'm going to explain it this way. I, I love this time of year. I love spring. I love going into summer. I love it. But something happens the older I get. I guess my body just starts to shut down on me. Around uh, two years ago, I started noticing uh, that when it got to be around this season, uh, I have terrible seasonal allergies. And, and I just, it was something that was new to me. I never struggled with allergies before. I had no uh, understanding of what allergies were. I didn't care. I didn't care about what the big deal was with pollen or, or allergens in the air. But now when I go outside, man, uh, my eyes would be itching. My face uh, and nose would be running. My throat would be all scratchy, man. I, um, I'd be scratching my legs and my arms anytime grass gets on me. And so uh, I'm constantly complaining to my wife because she's a medical professional. So I come to her and I say, listen, man, this, these, these seasonal allergies are killing me every day. Uh, I'm like, man, these seasonal allergies kill me. So one day she pops up and she says, here, take this pill. So she knows me and she knows that I don't just take medicine. I'm not the guy who takes medicine like that. I don't like to take uh, painkillers. I don't like to take Tylenol. I am suspicious anytime you hand me a pill. And I don't care if it's coming from a wife or from a doctor. So I'm asking her, what is this pill for before you just hand it to me? I'm not about to just swallow it. So she says, it's centrosine. So centrosine means nothing to me two years ago. Uh, I don't know what she's saying. So I, I, so I ask her, well, uh, I'm good. I, I don't want to take that. I don't want to take that. And she says, listen, boy, you need to take this pill. And so I go, well, why do I need to take the pill? And so what she explains to me is she says, uh, first of all, it'll stop you from always bothering me talking about your seasonal allergies. Uh, but what Centrosine does is it gives your body what it needs to handle allergy season. And so I said, say no more. How often do I need to take this pill? And so she says, well, it's a regimen that you take every day. You have to take uh, a daily dose of centrosine every single day so that your body can effectively handle allergy season. And beloved, if you would allow me to extrapolate on that and deal a little bit of hope, can I suggest to you that when you find yourself in a lament season and when you find yourself devastated 
and, and when you find yourself in a season of life that is ugly or in ruin, can I just tell you that you need to take a daily dose of hope in God. I don't care if you have to write it down on a piece of paper. I don't care if you have to write it on your mirror. I don't care if you have to type it to yourself on your phone. I don't care if you have to just write it on the back of your hand. My brothers and sisters, you have got to learn to speak hope into your soul. You need to wake up that those who hope in the Lord, he will renew their strength. Tell your soul why or you cast down. Oh my soul, hope in God. So I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. You got to keep hope alive, but it's a decision. Nobody can take your hope from you, and it's up to you to feed it to yourself. So when you read Lamentations uh, chapter 3, you find that uh, despite everything that's going on, and despite the, despite the chaos, um, he says, therefore I have hope because of the chesed, the steadfast love of God. Because God is compassionate, the compassion of God. And third, uh, because of the hope in God. And so my brothers and sisters, I just pray um, that something was said um, this morning to just give you a little bit more hope. And that something was said to kind of help you through this season. We all mess up. But God is, has a steadfast love for us. God, his mercies never end. Matter of fact, they're new every morning. And that we always have hope in God because he is able to do it all. If you're somebody here and you're not a child of God or you just want a relationship with God, we just pray uh, that if you have any questions about what was said, reach out to us. Our email is at 6 coc at yahoo.com. Uh, we'll make contact with you. We'll do correspondence with you. Maybe you just want to study the Bible. Uh, we will set up one-on-one -on -one correspondence with you so that we can help you uh, to grow closer and come uh, to a, a full knowledge of, of God. Um, but maybe you just want to, to, to be a child of God. We just pray, put your faith in Jesus, that he is who he said he was, that you make the decision now, listen, I, I'm ready to follow him. Uh, that, that is the idea of repentance, that you make that great confession, hey, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins. May God bless you. May God keep you. We pray for anybody uh, that, that uh, if you believe this message can help anybody, we just pray that you share forward, comment, reach out to us on all of the social media platforms at 6BCOC, at 6 Church of Christ. God bless you, and may God keep you. Next song is This Little Light of Mine. This little light of mine, you know I'm gonna make it shine. Oh, this little light of mine.
we've come to this portion of our service where we can take up the Lord's Supper. The scripture reading that I would be reading from can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. And it reads as follows. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are seek, weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Let us go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that as we take this bread, which we use to represent the body of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and as we drink this drink of this cup, which we use to represent the blood of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we do so in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. We ask these and all other blessings in your Son, Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let us partake. At this time, we have the opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of what he's blessed us with. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, and it reads as follows. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffer one. We realize that um, generosity by God's blessing secures increase, while stinginess leads to poverty instead of expected gain. The one who gives receives far more in return. If you will, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for all the many blessings that you bestowed upon us. Father, help us to recognize and realize that all that we have comes from you. And we need to not hold a portion of what you've blessed us with from you. We ask and pray that you continue to bless us and in return that we are a blessing to others. And Father, we realize that you love a cheerful giver, so let us give freely from the heart and not withhold back what's already yours. We ask these and all other blessings in your Son, Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Troubles in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. Oh, so much trouble. I have to cry sometimes. Well, I'm awake at night. But that's alright. Cause I know that Jesus is with me. Lord, Troubles in my home. In my home. I, have I have to pray sometimes. So much trouble. I have to pray sometimes. Well, I wake at night. But that's alright. Cause I know that Jesus. Lord, after a while, troubles in my life, I have to pray sometimes, so much trouble, pray sometimes, well, I lay awake at night, I lay awake at night, I lay awake at night, but 
you know that's all right. Yes, all right. Oh, I know that Jesus, Jesus he will fix. I know that Jesus, he will fix. I know that Jesus, he will fix. Oh, after a while. I want to thank everyone that has joined us this, this morning for this morning service. And in closing, please join us as we go to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for, for blessing us the way you have. We ask and pray that you would forgive us for any sins that we have committed against you and our trespasses against one another. We pray for all those who are, are sick and shut in, that you would bless them in a special way, and all those who are lost loved ones, uh, that you would nurse them back to a, uh, that you would uh, bless them and, and help them to uh, manage their hurt, their, their pain, that you would watch over them and, and mend their broken hearts and, and bind up their wounds. We pray for those who are lost loved ones, uh, Due to this COVID-19 virus, that you would you would comfort them and and guide them and, and bless them in a, in a special way, and those who are are sick from this this disease, that you would uh, nurse them back to a reasonable portion of health that that they desire or that you see fit. We ask and pray that you help us to understand that that you are God all by yourself and all alone, and that you would you have this thing under control, and we just ask that you would bring it to an end. Uh, that no more lives will be lost, and that you would uh, just, just help us to understand that that it may be for a reason unknown to us, but that you may get the glory out of it. We just ask and pray that you continue to watch over us as we uh, run this Christian race and lead us and guide us in all truth and righteousness. We thank you for life, health, and strength, but most of all for your Son, the Christ, who have, who have made all things possible. And we ask and pray that when we have come to the end of our our journey on this side of time that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ that he we present us to you as the unspotted and unblemished children of the most high God. But we again we thank you for all things, but most of all for your son the Savior who have made all things possible. It's in his precious name we ask these prayers and we pray. Again, it's all to your glory. Let us all say Amen. Thank you everybody for joining us into uh, today's worship service. Please be sure to look at your calendars for our weekly events that we host. Um, also, we added a new event to our calendar, which is May Pray. Please continue to look at that as well. Um, the church is open um, every Sunday from 12 to 1 if you need to get communion packets or if you need to do your giving here. Our phone number is 864-599-0384 if you need to reach us. And our email, if you have any questions concerning what you just heard, it's sigsbycoc at yahoo.com. 